Call the uh, Public Safety Committee meeting to order. It's about four minutes after 11. Uh, I have the assembly members identify themselves. Start with Suzanne. Suzanne McGrath. Christopher Constant. Fred Dyson. Dick Trainy. Forrest Dunbar. Pete Peterson. All right. Seneca Vino, Municipal Prosecutor. Justin Dolly B. Jack Carson All right. Thank you. Um, and I think there's some significant other people in the audience. Well, they're all significant, but people who have a dog in this fight and skin in the game and uh, probably quite a bit to contribute, and we will give you a chance as we can to do it. Uh, the uh, first order of business is I've asked the chief to give us a report on what's uh, our community struggles with drugs, uh, legal and illegal drugs, and the impact on our city and uh, how APD and administration are approaching the issue and the problem and future plans. Uh, secondly, uh, an ordinance that I introduced uh, that has to do with mandatory reporting of, of offenses against sexual offenses against children, and we have a, a substitute uh, to present today that has some changes that both came from. Uh, our assembly attorney and the prosecutor's office and I think uh, gets to where we need to be and it'll be I hopefully we will encourage the assembly to adopt the S version on Tuesday when we pass it and then I sorry it didn't make the uh, 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 onto the agenda but I've asked uh, also a, a bit of report on some new criminal activity down around the uh, Brother Francis Beans Cafe area that um, is very troubling. So we'll start with uh, uh, Chief Dahl, and he has opened the questions along the line. In general, I would there's several sequences uh, progressively that they're going to present, and if you, we can hold the questions till each piece is done, but I'll try to give everybody a um, chance to, to speak, and if I miss you, throw something at me. All right, Chief Dahl. Thank you, sir. So, uh, thank you very much for uh, asking to be here. Uh, I brought Lieutenant Carson with me. Uh, Lieutenant Jack Carson is uh, our drug unit commander. You probably know him because he's in charge of the CAP team, and so he, he's been, I think, uh, here in the past. But I asked him to come because he has the most specific sort of operational knowledge of <coughs> what APD is doing. Uh, before he starts, I'll give you just a little kind of an overview, but. Uh, essentially, uh, APD does have uh, active investigations uh, into illegal narcotics here in Anchorage. Uh, we partner very closely with the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, with the FBI, um, we work well with state troopers, and uh, also uh, the, uh, the ATF and E. So we have uh, a lot of partnerships that allow us to work on this, um, and we're, we have uh, some detectives that are assigned uh, full-time to those other agencies to work on this issue. So um, with that, I will uh, kind of let Lieutenant Carson take away. And for the record, we've been <coughs> joined by Assemblyman Wellton. <coughs> Thanks for allowing me to speak today. Well, I think with the drug stuff, it is truly exciting to come here and talk to you today about because last year we made some changes. Uh, we uh, kind of realigned our forces uh, before we had our drug units working under two different commands. Uh, communication was good, but could be better uh, with, with many departments and, and agencies across the nation. But what we did is we brought both those under the same command, so they're uh, both under uh, in crime suppression now, and so they're both going the same direction. And what we did in that realignment was is with our vice unit, and it does longer term, um, they're not really long term, those are up to the federal agencies, but longer term investigations where it'd be multiple buys, going after uh, you know, kind of those top offenders within our, within our community that are out there committing a lot of crime, bringing in a lot of the drugs, and to allow them to focus, because those investigations do take some time to go after those, uh, those individuals, because they're smarter, they're more concealed about the way they do things. <coughs> So they were focusing on them, and then uh, we kind of stood up the, our cap unit and got them into crime suppression, where they do the short-term investigations. So they're going out there, they're trying to get the biggest bang for the buck. They're going out in parking lots, they're doing what we call jump outs, where they just go in parking lots, but under covers. And they, they watch for drug activity, they watch for a drug deal. Um, and then when they see it, they establish probable cause, make contact, 
and they really are very good at uh, making arrests on those those people. In addition to making arrests on drug offenses, while they're out there looking for these drug activity, they're witnessing a lot of other crime. Um, they're witnessing you know robberies and thefts, stolen vehicles, things like that. That they're also making arrests on. Last year, our CAT team, uh, in its first year up and doing this, uh, Martin and they recovered about stolen vehicles, or about 20 stolen vehicles. They made almost 100 arrests uh, last year for a brand new unit. That, that's amazing. 67 of those 100 arrests were felony arrests, whether they were warrant charges or new felony uh, charges. Recovered about 25 firearms, um, a little over 300 grams of meth, 870 grams of heroin, 4,000 grams of marijuana and edibles. 53 grams of fentanyl. Um, to my knowledge, that's still the largest seizure of fentanyl in the state of Alaska. Um, so we're starting to see that come in. In addition, uh, with that case, uh, we work for federal partners and we're prosecuting those people federally uh, where we seize that fentanyl. Um, so, you know, kind of a kind of speak to how effective uh, some of this is. And, you know, a lot of people just focus on the drug side of it. it there's a lot of violent crime that comes along with drug offenses. So kind of highlight one of the cases uh, last year that the, the crime suppression side of CAP did is, is what they were doing kind of what they do. They were sitting out in an apartment lot in South Anchorage uh, looking for things that don't look right. That's what we do in law enforcement. And they observe a vehicle um, back into a closed business, uh, sit there, look around, look nervous, run the plate. Just that day, a located had been stuck on that plate by the Alaska State Troopers for an attempted homicide. Um, they, we're able to follow the vehicle, get a takedown on that vehicle where we had contact with the occupants of that vehicle. And um, the passenger had a, a firearm on him along with the ballistic vest on. The driver uh, in the vehicle had out of state warrants for his arrest, um, which we arrested him on. Ultimately, found drugs on occupants of the vehicle, got a search warrant for the vehicle. So we ended up seizing over a, uh, just about a half pound of heroin in that vehicle. From, from a person that had kind of come up to our state recently, with Dion had warrants. Um, so that kind of shows the effectiveness of going out into these parking lots and doing these kind of deals, because it, it's truly getting violent people off the street, not just drug offenses, violent people. Um, there was, I think, total of three firearms, one of the firearms was stolen uh, with that vehicle, and it, it, it kind of highlights the, the good work that, that they're doing out there. You know, our vice unit last year, um, they seized about uh, 3.5 kilograms of heroin opium, which is an enormous amount um, of heroin opium, 12 pounds of meth, and over 100 pounds of marijuana last year, and that's our long-term drug unit. Things uh, that are kind of streamlined, streamlined with this new organization that we all have them under one command, also our task force officers are under one command. Our task force officers, we have spaced out, we have uh, a couple over at the FBI, uh, DEA, U.S. Marshals, and uh, they're out there and they're kind of a streamline into these federal agencies uh, so that we have access to some of the federal agencies' resources and gives our resource uh, access to the federal agencies to a lot of our resources so we can team up, share resources uh, to go after a common goal, and that's uh, going after violent offenders and drug dealers within the, the Anchorage area. Um, I can tell you those task force officers are uh, doing an enormous job over there. I, I don't have the exact number today, but I can tell you, you know, they made seizures of up over a, a half million dollars. Um, the FBI alone last year, I think, was about 400, 400,000 or so uh, worth of uh, cash and asset seizures. And uh, they made about, uh, about 40 indict federal indictments of um, of drug and violent offender offenses, like gun offenses and things like that, um, and they just they do an enormous, uh, an enormous and a good a good job, and they're they're very very busy. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, on the enforcement side, we got a lot of what we need. The Anchorage Police Department, the City of Anchorage, the Assembly, you guys are providing a lot of what we need to do it. Um, you know, if you ask me, you know. I would dream and I always want more, uh, but it doesn't mean that we need it. We are we, we are given what we need. Um, we are the teams are doing a, a really good job. They're out there arresting a lot of people. They're doing good cases, um, and we're putting the bad guys in jail at the end of the day. So I I, I think that's the, the big message out there is, is that um, on the enforcement side, uh, I, I think we're doing a, a better job than I've than I've seen in 18 years. I've been here at the Anchorage Police Department on the enforcement side. Questions? 
I would add just a little bit that, or I'll add, answer questions first, sorry. But go ahead. I just, I was gonna throw in, uh, I know that uh, Mr. Dyson had asked uh, what our general feeling uh, was as far as where a lot of this flows from. Yeah, and, hold on to that one, okay. we'll finish this. Uh, we've been joined by Mr. Croft. Thank Mr. Wilson has a question. John. Maybe it would wait, but <clears throat> so it, what, what does 12 pounds of meth look like? Uh, a pound of meth is about this big. So 12 so is a big rock. No smaller than a great pound. So, I'm not a great pound. So that sounds like you're getting a lot of stuff, but are we making a dent? I think, yes, I think, you know, in a, in a community there's always going to be, you know, there's going to be drugs in any large community. There's, that's that's going to be there, and there's going to be, you know, importing and exporting drugs, especially with a, a city like Anchorage. We're a hub. We're one of the major hubs coming into Alaska. With that being said, um, are, you know, are we making a dent? Yes, I think on the arrest side, we're doing a good job. Uh, we're arresting a lot of people. Uh, we're at a, a rate much higher than, than we've done in a long time, if not ever done. We're, we're working with our federal partners and streamlining cases into the federal system. The federal, the federal partners are uh, more willing than ever to take these cases and work with us. Cases in the past, they've said no to us. Um, but now they're saying yes, they're welcoming them, and they're indicting them, and they're indicting them quick for us. Um, John. So following up on that, I guess, <clears throat> so you're getting a lot of bad guys off the street, which is extremely good. But does this, um, does this make an um, impact on the number of people addicted to these drugs and causing problems to themselves and others? I, to, Mr. to Mr. Whittleton, I think that, uh, you know, having constant law enforcement pressure, especially on the illegal narcotic trade, I think does make a difference. Obviously, um, that doesn't cure somebody of their addiction. <coughs> if somebody does have an addiction to whether it's an illegal narcotic or a prescription uh, medication of some kind, um, you know, no amount of law enforcement is going to change that. And obviously, having uh, programs available <coughs> for those people to uh, move into, uh, that's the critical part of getting somebody to, you know, to be able to deal with their addiction. Um, you know, something I've said in the past, and I will continue to say, is law enforcement can be a great partner in those kind of programs because we have contact with people when they are at their lowest state. You know, they're. Uh, fighting through their addiction, they're involved in criminal activity to support it or to acquire more drugs. And so if we uh, have uh, resources that we can connect those people with, that's the point in time where it actually can make a difference in their life. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so uh, are we able to trace back uh, the source of this meth? Is this meth that's coming from Mexico or the valley or here in town or from all over? No, that's a good question, sir. Uh, so I was, and that segues right into what I was going to talk about next. Um, Mr. Dyson had asked, you know, what we felt uh, the pathway was for uh, for the drugs coming to Alaska, and I, I think like everything that comes to Alaska, there are a lot of different pathways. But we, when I speak to our federal partners and our task force officers that are working with them, we generally feel that a lot of the illegal narcotics are flowing across the southwest border and up the west coast. That's not uh, by any stretch of the imagination the only pathway, but it seems to be the primary one. And like Lieutenant Carson mentioned earlier, obviously Anchorage is a hub city. And it doesn't matter what product you're acquiring uh, anywhere in Alaska, chances are very good that it flowed through Anchorage at one point. So um, we're very aware of that. Uh, we, uh, ABD, uh, is gonna be participating in uh, the high intensity drug trafficking area that the, uh, was just awarded to the state of Alaska. If we've talked about it briefly, I think here once, but also there was some uh, media about it. It's essentially a program that's run out of the White House through the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And uh, it provides federal funding for state and local and federal agencies to work together on interdicting drug trafficking. And in my opinion, I, I think that's something that, um, that we could do better here in Anchorage. I think there is a lot of, uh, uh, product that flows through the airport, uh, both in packages and attached to people. And I think that having the ability to uh, interdict that um, will go a little bit further to making a dent, uh, like Mr. Weddleton asked about. So uh, the Anchorage Police Department will have a seat on the executive board of the HIDA. Um, we're going to participate in the Anchorage-based task force. 
and I think that that is, uh, is going to make a further impact um, as we work through the rest of this year getting that set up uh, at, during interdiction at the airport. Follow up? Pete, go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, do you, are you using the drug dogs or to try to catch them at the airports uh, in with the luggage they're bringing in or well, and with, with if you are, do you have enough of them? Too <laughs> far down into the details of how that works. Um, we, we do use uh, scent detection canines uh, from time to time, uh, as does the state. Um, and, but there are a variety of methods to doing interdiction uh, at the airport. And uh, it's, it's not the kind of thing that you can just have a dog hang out in the terminal and check everybody that flows past. Um, so it has to be a little bit more targeted than that. But we do, uh, we do use scent detection canines for that. And Thank you. in general, we're all curious about things. What we don't want to do is talk publicly here about exact things of how they're doing and, and get the information about out that would hinder charges and, and um, stuff. Uh, Mr. Cheney? Thank you, Chief. With all the products you're collecting, do you guys have enough storage space now? And now this is the goal we're going to talk about later today, but I'm concerned that you have more storage if we go to the new place. But how many officers do you need for this? Because we've been building up the patrol officers, but we've not been giving you money just for normal officers to deal with evidence. And how many more do you need? So we, that's a great question. Thank you, sir. There, we do need additional staff in like proper and evidence, dispatch, records, all the places that support sworn officers. I think we have done, and this body has been uh, tremendous in its support of the police department, and we have done a very good job over the last few years of building that up. We're going to hire another 18 recruits uh, in about a week and a half. That's going to bring us pretty darn close to 450 officers at APD, bigger than we've ever been. We're very, very close to 100% staffed uh, with the allocation we have in the 2018 budget, which for an agency our size is fairly remarkable. Um, but you're right. I mean, this is a, a good point to, uh, I think, it, for the department to sort of pause on the growth of the sworn staff and see what it feels like to be that big and what level of service we're able to provide. Um, and take some time to focus on the non-sworn staff, which is that support staff that works in property and dispatch and records and, uh, and some of our other uh, needs to handle that kind of stuff. Because the short answer, sir, to your question is no, we don't have space to store stuff. Chief, what I need from you then is a breakdown how many non-sworn officers you need. Because if SAP ever works, and we know what fund balance <laughs> is, which we're so far into this year, it's ridiculous. But anyway, if they never get it to work, we know what fund balance is. Then we're going to have to another budget revision come through. And I'd like to get you the evidence people you need and other non sworn officers. Thank you. I do have that number. I just don't have it with me today, okay. but I'll get to you. Get it with you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Trini has got to a point that I had made talking with Chief Dahl. At the end of the process, we, the Assembly, want to say to you what can we do to help? What are the impediments that we can help to get away with, get, get, do away with? Uh, Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is this the appropriate time for questions? Or you said there was a, is there more to the presentation? You oh, do yeah, questions? we're going to go through several steps here. I think that's probably the bulk of it, unless we missed something that uh, you were expecting us to present, and we can certainly circle back to that. Oh. But we're okay, we'll go ahead, Mr. Dunbar. Questions. Sure. Uh, so I, I had a conversation uh, with Brian Wilson at the APD. He was talking about the experience of some of his uh, line officers, and it gets back to what Mr. Welton was saying about um, you know, are we actually impacting the problem? And what Brian was saying is that uh, sometimes officers will encounter a person who needs detox or needs tr uh, treatment and there's nowhere to take them. And so I guess I want to, but he mentioned that perhaps at one point there was, it was kind of unclear. Could you speak a little bit about whether there's historical precedent for doing that for a like diversion program and then how that might work and if you would support that? Sure, thank you, sir, for the question. I think that, um, you know, I think back to when I was a patrol officer and there was some ability to uh, transport people that required that kind of care to the hospital, and then I think that there may have been some treatment facilities available, um, but it, I don't think it was ever extremely robust. I feel like right now the answer is that there are not a lot of options for that, but the police department would very much support that. Um, 
you know, police officers become police officers because they want to help people and solve problems. And if you're having contact with the same people for the same thing over and over again, that can be frustrating uh, for everybody involved, obviously. And so, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think that we're in a unique position to be a very good partner for any treatment program because we do have contact with people at that point in their life where they might be receptive to receiving assistance. And, you know, frequently uh, throughout the normal course of the rest of their life, they are not. So I think that having, uh, you know, us uh, provide that link up could be very effective. Thank you, Mr. Chief. M Mr. Cross? Yeah, just a quick clar <coughs> clarification. You said uh, that you thought that things came up through the southwest and I immediately thought of Dutch Harbor. But did you mean the southwest of the U.S.? Yeah, I'm sorry, southwest okay. border of the United States. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, and I have a question, uh, Mr. Curl. Um, it sounds like you guys are doing pretty darn good at uh, catching bad guys and, and stuff. How does the how well is the next step hap working? The those folks going to trial uh, and getting sentenced and being incarcerated. Well, I think with the Andrews Police Department, our focus is on investigating the crime, establishing probable cause and then making the actual physical arrests. And then on the follow-up side of it, we, we assist through the prosecution of it, by evidence, turn it over, things like that. But our, our main job is the enforcement side, and that's what that's where our knowledge base is, and that's what we focus on. Uh, the detention side of the state of Alaska, and that's kind of their, their expertise. I think they'd be almost better to answer that. Mr. Dahl, do you want to comment? I think that Lieutenant Carson covered it fairly well. We're, uh, we're focused on the, the field operations okay. work. I, I got that. What I worry is that with the uh, judicial system, the uh, prosecutors and um, the parole supervision and all those intermediate steps, the swift, sure justice isn't happening. And uh, these... You keep encounter, encountering it too many of the same people who are out waiting trial or whatever and um, they're not quickly ending up uh, incarcerated or, or wherever is appropriate for them. And I realize it's not your job, but if that isn't happening, you know, then there are other choke points in the process that we need to be helpful if we can and advocates for help when it's a state responsibility. So. I realize it's not your job, <clears throat> but you, like all of us, ought to be able to see when you're doing a really good job or the next steps happening, and, and I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, more to your presentation? Uh, no, sir, that was essentially the end of it. I just wanted to uh, kind of finish up with that look towards the near future and um, expanding our uh, participation with uh, our state and federal partners uh, on the interdiction effort and um, we're looking forward to that unfolding across the summer and hopefully beginning operations this fall. All right, so what are the, so all of us are cognizant of the opiates and the legal drugs that are illegally uh, getting out into the black market and uh, some medical professionals who are perhaps promiscuous in their prescribing and uh, a whole new level of addiction to, to the opiates uh, that's different. Uh, so can you talk a little bit in the trend of the drugs that have happened you know, in the last few years? Yes, I think we're mirroring a lot to do with the with the rest of the United States is obviously the opiates uh, have hit you know, all uh, cities hard in recent times. So we have seen the increase in the opiate use, um, whether it be you know opium, heroin, fentanyl, um, prescription drugs. It, it, it's definitely uh, hit us by storm. It's been a been a challenge. I think a lot of uh, the different you know cities and agencies across the nation are communicating. Uh, well, especially with modern technology and kind of we're looking at what works and what doesn't work and, and we're going after it, I think. So opium is, a, you know, one that's kind of spiked on us. Um, with that being said, I think that there's a lot of things in motion uh, across the nation, in, especially in Anchorage, that is, uh, that is shifting to deal with that problem. 
And then we've had you know, the traditional drugs of, you know, you still have the cocaine, meth, things like that. But we've, you know, recent years, we've seen a lot of drop off in the cocaine use um, as one of the current trends. Um, but, uh, you know, the meth, the meth's kind of been there, kind of stayed there as a constant. And the opium's kind of made surges with the, the prescription, um, not the prescription and the, the, the heroin side. They, other than that, a lot of, uh, a lot of the current trends, uh, I mean, they're steady. So they're pretty steady and, you know, there's years that'll spike and there's years that'll go down. Um, you know, a lot of that, that spike is, you know, looks statistical versus actually true representation in the community. Just because we all of a sudden get a big arrest and seize a lot of drugs, it can make it look like a spike, but truly it's not. It's just we, we caught a big player. In the <coughs> so I, I would uh, encourage people not to focus so much on the stats side of it. It's, uh, there's a lot more going on in the community. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you've mentioned numerous substances, but I haven't heard you t talk anything about spice. So are we still having some spice problems? We still have, yes, we still have spice problems. We made three arrests for spice uh, this last week. Um, we're not going to do some enforcement. Uh, again, on the, it is, you know, the spice is challenging. It's, it's an adaptive drug right, that is challenging to get. Um, but with that being said, it, we're still seeing it. Um, I don't think we're seeing a, a, a spike in it. Um, but I think that you, uh, it's there. Um, when we really notice it is when bad strands come through and we start seeing the medical emergencies popping up with it is when we start becoming how aware of how much is out there. Um, but it's, it's, it's been there, it's there, it's a cheap alternative uh, to some of the other drugs. Um, and it's, it's, it's gonna stay around for a while. So we do our best to enforce it uh, with the laws that are set out there for it. And like I said, we're out there, we're out there making arrests. We made arrests this last week. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Trini. We did change the law on spice, though, so we didn't have the same specific parameters because you're right, drug dealers that make this have changed it. I think we changed the law to allow you to adapt the law to the spice. Is that working for you? I think the muni law parrots how the rest of the state and the United States are going a lot of I think the state part of the law is yeah. definitely very generous and allows us to, to investigate spice much better than the state of Alaska gets to with their current laws because they, they rely on certain uh, chemical compounds right. and, and strains. We don't. Like, ours is a lot more open and forgiving and, and allows a true enforcement of the drug, very much so. Well, I appreciate the farm, the city's law department bringing this to us and some members involved in it. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, so the um, I've seen in the paper a couple of uh, uh, physicians got busted, you know, uh, who have been quite promiscuous. Uh, I guess I want to know in general, how's that going? Uh, taking action against um, people with prescriptive authority or abusing it? I think it's going fairly well. You know, the Drug Enforcement Administration is the agency that enforces that and uh, in providers uh, license to distribute medication. And so that's something I know uh, from talking uh, with uh, the assistant special agent in charge here in Anchorage, that's something they're very focused on as an agency, so uh, we work with them on a regular basis. We have a task force officer that's based with DEA, and I know that's something that they're looking at in Anchorage, and it, recently they've had some success with it. Yeah, uh, Washington, D.C. DEA agent I know told me that they get most people tips, drugs, or uh, uh, dogs, and when the drugs are in transport, yeah. Um, all right. <coughs> Any other questions? Can Mr. I branch Littleton? away from drugs? Sir? Can I branch away from drugs? Sure. Do you have a drug one? No, but after him, can I also branch? Sure. <laughs> I'm moving away from drugs a little bit. And this is just a uh, response to some talks with constituents the last month or two. And I think, uh, you know, police are doing probably a good job, just burglaries and thefts and so on. And But what happens is people will report it, and we've talked to an officer, but then they don't hear anything for some length of time. And they're frustrated. They say, oh, nothing is being done. And I'm fairly certain something is being done. But we all look bad. You look bad. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've heard as well, the officer who did that, he's off now or he hasn't time and so on. But it, it surprises me that an officer would be doing the follow-up on things like that because we want them out handcuffing people. And is it, which support staff normally do that and you don't have enough? Or what, um, why is an officer doing basically, here's what we did, you know, maybe call the 
victim and just report, or even an email? It depends on the case. Uh, in some cases, the patrol officer will uh, continue to carry it and work on it. Uh, in a lot of cases, they'll try to hand them off to detectives, depending on what the circumstances are. Um, we have <coughs> been, frankly, short in the property section of detectives for quite some time. Uh, we're going through the process, I think, actually, this week, if I'm not mistaken, can probably correct that. So this week we're adding four detectives to the property crime section. That's part of, you know, you hear us talk about hiring new people, they go to the academy, they go to the training, all that stuff takes a really long time. Well, we're in the phase of that uh, growth where we're now starting to branch out to other places from patrol and start filling, uh, you know, various units that, uh, that suffered uh, cuts, you know, uh, years ago. So uh, <coughs> property crimes is one of those places and that is something that will directly uh, help that particular issue of not getting that call back from a detective. Um, same thing with patrol officers. The more officers we end up having on patrol, the more free time they have to make those kind of phone calls. Um, something else that we're doing this summer is uh, we're working our way through the process and we're finally gonna get cell phones for all of our officers to use. They still don't have phones that are issued by the department. And part of the expectation there is that they will take the time to make those follow-ups, whether it's emails, phone calls, whatever. Um, Something that um, I've acknowledged in the past, and I, when I talk to uh, residents, I say the same thing. Um, the department is very good at doing things. We are not great right now at closing that loop and providing the, the feedback. And that's something we really want to change. We're, we're pushing in a number of different directions to make that better. Um, some of the things that we're doing are as simple as just paper cards that we can hang on a doorknob that says, we're here, we were here, and this is what we did. And we didn't want to wake you up, but we want to let you know that we stopped by and address the issue. So. Um, I want to make sure that all the folks in the field that are working really hard every day get the credit for all the work they're doing and people understand what, what was done to resolve their issues. So um, that is, that's something we're pushing pretty hard on. All right. Thank you. Suzanne? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Following up on um, Mr. Whittleton's point, we had a constituent who experienced three um, break-ins in a short amount of time. And for the last one, um, he was out of town, so there was some frustration because he wasn't able to connect with APD um, until about 24 hours later. And I know that's been addressed and dealt with. So um, two questions from that. What would be reasonable a reasonable expectation for folks in terms of if there is a break-in um, after the fact? I mean, clearly not when someone might still be there. When can they expect um, what time frame for, like, police to be able to respond? Um, initially or after the fact? Um, initially and after the fact. Um, like in this particular case, um, the constituent was calling the non-emergency number, and it, it took about 24 hours until he heard back and was able um, to relay his account and um, talk with police. So is it reasonable, given that we have more staffing now for um, people to be able to get in contact with the police for an, a, a break-in that's already occurred, say, within 24 hours? Or is it reasonable to expect that a police officer will be able to come to their home within six hours? Or or does it just depend on too many things to be able to kind of give any guidelines for expectations, would you say? Uh, no, ma'am. So that's a great question, and I think you're right. I mean, there are a lot of... Uh, variables that play into all of those turnaround times. And it's, it depends on the particular circumstances with that event. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it depends on what else is going on in town. Obviously, the department's objective is to respond to all of those things as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective, sooner is always better. Um, but, you know, there is a prioritization system, in, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, in progress, violent crimes obviously are, right. you know, the top of the list. Right. And uh, so, um, but, you know, the, the answer to your overall question is yes. You know, increased staffing uh, should help alleviate some of those wait times, whether it's waiting on the phone to talk to dispatch, waiting for the patrol officer to arrive at your house, waiting for that phone call back to give you, you know, a status update. Those are all things that we want to improve. I think those things have been improving, and they're going to continue to improve throughout this year. You know, we just had 30 officers graduate from the police academy, and they're in field training now, so towards the end of the summer, they will actually, you know, complete their training and become productive members of the department, and that's a pretty significant add to people out doing work. So, um, you know, my anticipation is that those things will continue to improve as uh, these new people come online and complete their training. Okay, thank you. 
and Mr. Chair, uh, a follow-up to that. We had talked earlier about community council boundaries um, being overlaid with um, individual police officers, or how is that going? Or we had a, a question about that at a community council meeting last week, wondering if that's still going forward or if it's already happening. It is still going forward. Um, we have, uh, there's, there's a lot of sort of behind the scenes things that are happening with that, and it's, it's all software type stuff inside the police department. We're rolling out an entirely new system that is computer aided dispatching and records management and the mobile stuff that the officers do in the field. Mm -hmm. And we anticipate that coming online in mid-July. Uh, and that will, that rollout will include the realignment of the, the patrol boundaries. Um, we do want those to overlap a little bit better or be aligned a little bit better with uh, community council boundaries mm -hmm. uh, for a whole, a whole variety of reasons. Um, but probably the most important of which is for officers to uh, sort of get to know the councils in their area. Um, along with that, we want to have, try to improve the stability of where officers work so they get used to working in the same area, they get to know the people there, they get to know the issues there. Um, I can tell you having been a patrol officer, uh, that's, that's what every patrol officer wants. They want to be in their, their space all the time. They don't like getting moved around that much. Um, when you don't have adequate staff and you're constantly trying to fill a hole, there's a lot more shuffle. And so we hope to see that stabilize as well and for all those things to kind of come together. Uh, one of the side effects of that will be, um, and sort of one of the intended side effects, will be that when a community council asks us about the activity in their area, it'll be a lot easier for us to sort of define what that looks like because right now, one of our sort of geographic subdivisions that we collect data by might span two or three council districts. And so telling one council district just what's going on in their space can become a little bit more difficult. But we would like that to be a little better too. Thank you. Chris. Thank you. So one question that's come up a few times in the last two weeks is the question of the foot patrols. And they've been very successful in the downtown, but my neighbors in Mountain View and Fairview have been complaining that they don't see them. Are they still being deployed? And if so, what's their frequency? How's that working? And if not, what's the plan? Um, we do still have foot patrol pretty regularly, uh, especially during the summer it tends to pick up because a lot of the school resource officers that aren't needed for summer school get redeployed to do that. And uh, in the core downtown area, a lot of that is foot. Um, but in some of the neighborhoods and parks and trails around town, it tends to be more bicycle because they can cover a little bit more territory uh, than, just w than just walking. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would expect that uh, people should see a more significant presence throughout the summer for that kind of uh, patrol. Uh, ultimately, I mean, I'd love to get to a place where even uh, patrol officers have time to get out and walk around their beat a little bit from time to time. And so we are still pushing in that direction, but I'm not sure that we're there yet. Mr. Training, I was reading an issue up in Palmer, what in my Sioux area, where they're picking up people doing burglaries that still have anchor bracelets on them. So my question is, what do we do when we run into somebody in commissioner crime that says an anchor bracelet on them? Is there a compound, can we compound the penalty on them or we just turn over the state and say, oh, you got somebody loose? Well, that's a good question. Uh, typically what happens is we contact, uh, you know, adult probation parole, if that's who they're responsible to, or the pretrial enforcement division and let them know that we're having contact with somebody that they're monitoring. And then it's ultimately, um, they're, they're the entity that has the authority to address the misbehavior while being at the okay, So we don't charge them anything else, we just get a hold of them and say, it okay. It depends. It could be a, a violation of their conditions of release, but it sort of depends kind of specifically on what the scenario is. Okay. Thank you, Chief, because I was surprised to see they, yesterday they caught a guy doing a burglary, shut his ankle bracelet off. It's like, okay, doesn't that tell you where he's at? The what? Thanks, Chief. All right. One last question. Chris. Thank you. You know, it just dawned on me that now we've been operating under the new regime at the state with their pretrial services for four months. And have you had any intersection, or do you know, can you give us a report on how that's working from a municipal perspective? No, I don't know if I can off the top of my head. I've heard a little bit of anecdotal information uh, about it, but I don't, you know, that's something that we could maybe um, sort of do an internal query on and get a, a better sense of what that looks like from an operational, like, street level perspective. Because that's when I just don't know off the top of my head. It would be great to take that report. Can, can you check? 
Fred, can I ask something? Yeah, Mr. Crow. Yeah, just following up on those two, um, so Seneca, we had a conversation about electronic monitoring, and is that all being taken over by the state? Is there continued to be private electronic monitoring, or it's all state run? What we've been seeing at bail hearings is that it's all the state's pre-trial enforcement division is doing ankle monitoring. And, and those, uh, from talking to prosecutors, um, do, are, do those have location services, or they're more limited? They don't tell you where a person is? My understanding is, my limited understanding is that there is a, uh, it's generally curfew related, and so the monitor has to check in with a box that's located at the person's house. I do, I do believe they may have resources to do location um, monitoring, perhaps in connection with alcohol monitoring, but I don't know how, uh, how often they're using that. Seems like they'll be useful, yeah, for knowing you're not in a bar, but then also location is useful for saying, and you're not near the victim's house, you know, you're not going back in these, these areas. Um, I'd heard that the state either hadn't implemented or that the devices they use don't do location. Do you, do you know of that? The only thing I'm familiar with is that many of them are the curfew style, so it's just whether you're checking it at home when you're supposed to be, and or not a location base. Right. And do we do we have any ability to affect that, or is that state law involved? <coughs> that is, can we say you shall have I guess location we, services? Yeah, yeah, a different type of ankle monitor. Can we do that in city law? I don't. Uh, yeah, could, I guess we can't do it for enforcement of state law, then. Right. but could we do it for city law? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because okay. you're talking about bail release there. <coughs> Thanks, that, that's what I mean. All right. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, so, as we've all understand the uh, drug-related how, what I want to know is what proportion of the, of the property crime is related to uh, drug use? I don't have an exact percentage, but I feel like based on my experience as a patrol officer and then supervising various sections of the department throughout the years that the percentage is fairly high. But I just don't have an exact number for you. Right. It's, it's a little bit difficult to track down sure. sometimes because you don't always know if somebody is using. Um, but I think <clears throat> anecdotally I can say it's, it's pretty high. So I assume that people are you know, shoplifting and, and stealing uh, stuff. Most of it is for resale, you know, on the black market and so on. How about the stealing cars? The, the car theft is a little bit unique in Anchorage in that the cars are not generally stolen and then resold someplace or broken down into parts. They're stolen, they're used in other criminal activity, and then they're abandoned. Um, or they're recovered by the police department, occupied, and then of course we make arrests as appropriate. But uh, it's not—it's not like you might see in some parts of the southern United States where they're stolen and then transported across the border and sold. Sure. Anything like that. But would you suspect that many of the vehicles that are stolen are used in the drug trade? Oh yes. Yeah. I, All right. That would be my suspicion. Yeah. Um, in years past, when I talked to your gang guys, they said our gangs here are a bit unique. They're not geographical, territorial, and they're not centered on a particular enterprise, numbers, uh, prostitution, drugs, or whatever, and that most of the gang shooting one another wasn't arguing over turf or, or uh, stuff. It had to do with interpersonal stuff. I'm sorry, I didn't. What's your sense of what our gangs here are about? I think that remains largely true, and I think your point about uh, geography and enterprise mm -hmm. remains true. Also, ethnicity. It, uh, they're, they're, very, uh, they're very well integrated, and they change frequently. So when you think about from a law enforcement perspective that to identify a criminal street gang or a member of a criminal street gang, there's a very specific legal definition, and sometimes that's difficult to apply here because the allegiances change rapidly, um, and it, it's kind of always in a constant state of churn. 
and so it, it does look a little different, in, but I think you're right. I mean, a lot of times there's still disputes that uh, turn violent over drugs and money, but also sometimes interpersonal relationships is a big one. And uh, so I, I think that that, uh, to a large extent, remains true. And uh, mostly they shoot one another, and it's only incidental when non-criminal people get hurt because they're around where shots are going or whatever. Right, I mean, there is a lot of uh, the violent crime where the people involved are known to each other, but I think that from our perspective, one of the biggest issues with that is that shooting a gun inside the city is dangerous for everybody that lives here. And so, um, you know, anybody in the area is potentially a victim or has been a victim, you know, even recently. So that's obviously a high concern for us. Is it... Uh, Historically, I think it's been true that people who are dealing drugs on the lowest level are often have their own addiction issues. Is that true here? Yes, very much so. A lot of, you know, when you're talking with substance abuse, yeah. um, it, it's hard. You know, people can keep it together for a while. Yeah. Uh, some people can keep it together for a long time. But the majority of people who get addicted to a substance, the, their life around them starts unspooling with shortly followed with unemployment. So they have their addictions, they have their needs they need to meet, and those are generally the fire through the sale of drugs, even on the low low level, just so that they can continue to use drugs. They're selling, trying to maintain the, the, the system that they've created. Uh, Chief, I, thank you. I, I assume that here in South Central, not much, of, not a very high percentage of the drugs comes in by sea. I don't think so. Yeah, I would expect not. Probably different in Southeast. Yeah. One last question I have. Uh, from the literature and other people's experience, or even our own, has the legalization of marijuana uh, affected any other part of the drug abuse? Um, right now it's kind of early to, to tell you, to you uh, just on face value. It, it's, I'm not seeing that. Um, it is, but it's early in the game as far as we've recently just really implemented laws. We're sure. starting to look at some of the statistics that are coming in. There's been other recent law changes uh, that are significant within our uh, our state. So those compound and make it even more difficult to really identify the causes of everything. So it'll be some time until we can really pin that down. Yeah. Be for sure, other than and, opinion. Um, in English, Fred. Uh, well, how does the retail price of marijuana compare to the street price? They've uh, traditionally they've been the retail price was significantly higher. Um, as of uh, recent, a lot of the prices are coming down uh, closer together. Um, but you know, even with that, you're you know you're always going to see a black market uh, of of marijuana. It's, it's going to be out there, um, even with the retail prices coming down. There's just uh, people who got their marijuana from certain groups of people for a, a long time and they're going to continue to do that. Um, with that being said, you know, the commercial operations that are up and operating uh, are operating under a lot of regulations um, that are there and generally those operations that are operating within the laws are very clean and well run. Yeah, and that's my perception as well. Are we seeing any legal marijuana ending up in, like in the hands of children or so on? that it's inappropriate? I think not that we're aware of, at least on the sales side of it. What happens after the store sells yeah. it and where it goes is... All right. Uh, Mr. Trini? Just Chief, thank you for coming to talk to us today. It was interesting with the car theft, the amount that we have. I'm hearing businesses are running ads now to make your car theft proof. Is your car been recovered? Come and see us. We'll rekey it and we'll set up so it can be stolen again. It's always interesting when we reach that amount of cars being stolen that the other people are out there not advertising business to stop it from happening. So thanks for recovering them, but it, the theft still goes on to record numbers. We're, we're trying some things that we hope will have an impact on that. Thanks, Chief. Yep. Chris, Chairman. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. Uh, interesting you verge into the topic of the marijuana and alcohol, the prohibition issues. I have a different opinion. That, uh, it will be at some point in the not too distant future where the price point of the marijuana on the retail market pushes out 
the illegal, the black markets, we rarely now, after 80 years, see uh, bootleg stills operating and selling alcohol at cut rates. And so I think at some point that will equalize. But that's beside the point um, that I'm hoping to get to. So uh, I said to you, Captain, and uh, to the Chief, I'd like to pass it on to you. I often drive through the neighborhood, the hot spot, you know, around Third and Carluck and all the businesses that are around there. And I <clears throat> had the opportunity to drive through the neighborhood with the documentary and the filmmaker. And as we were going through, there was a business owner who I know I stopped to say hi to, who was complaining that APD wasn't doing their job. And there was a passed out person, and it was, you know, the third passed out person I'd seen in a 20 minute drive. Each time the CAP team had been at the first two, your officer, Officer Nelson, I believe, um, when I got there and observed, did everything he needed to do and did it flawlessly. And so, um, as I got there and had a conversation with this individual business owner and pointed out, well, look what they just did. This is exactly how it's supposed to work. Um, they were, their, their attitude changed a little bit. And I just want to say good job to your team because there are numerous more calls and problems than we can deal with and we'll try to put out the fires where we can. And your officers in just one of several difficult situations did everything just right. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other things you want to follow up on? Uh, three or four years ago, uh, doctor's offices were getting hit uh, where they thought there might be a supply of drugs. And all of us had seen a sign that says, no uh, psychoactive drugs stored on these premises and stuff. <laughs> what, is there anything going on with that? Is it still an issue problem? I mean, it, it, our, our random incidents can occur, yes, but there's not an epidemic or a, a surge or even a pattern of it. But, um, yeah, I think the target um, real estate offices or the offices have done preemptively what they can. All right. I appreciate it, and uh, it was useful. I particularly applaud my uh, colleagues' pretty insightful questions and the question of what we can do to help. And uh, and sounds like they have identified s several areas where there needs to be re more resources to be able to let you guys do what you want to do. Thank you, and thank you for your service, and you guys too. Thanks. <clears throat> Next, we're going to take up uh, uh, AO 2018 34 Parents S. This is the ordinance, proposed ordinance on uh, mandatory reporting. And uh, we have had some good in interaction with the prosecutor's office and Ms. Fulterney, and they've raised some issues and, and a few other folks. Uh, Mr. Gates, would you like to explain the changes between the original version and the S version? Um, sure. Thank you, Mr. Dyson. Um, the good news is I'll be very brief. There are not many changes based on uh, comments received at the last county meeting and uh, the dialogue with the municipal prosecutor's office. Uh, this S version has just one change. On page two, uh, we're doing the inclusion of the unlawful state to prefer sending an explicit image of a minor. I called it 16 law. So the prosecutor's office pointed out that we already have an existing code section. It's not in this AO draft because it's not being amended, but it's in our current code. It's 8540, sexual, explo ex sexual exploitation of minors. And this offense covers exactly what's covered by this proposed new offense. So we're removing it from this ordinance. Uh, that existing code section covers more situations as well. So basically unnecessary to duplicate its own new code. Uh, we had several um, other suggestions from the municipal prosecutor's office for changes. Um, however, I believe the prosecutor discuss concerns with other uh, sections in this ordinance. This S version so far is a draft, and our objective is to have a final S version draft uh, sponsored by Mr. Dyson for the addendum uh, submitted this Friday. So uh, after today's meeting, we may see some further changes. All right, thank you. And, and uh, uh, for my colleagues, uh, just to remind you what we're doing is largely taking the state's mandatory reporting law on sexual abuse of minors 
putting in this in the city code. Uh, the there was a s section that Mr. Gates included had reporting of crimes against uh, uh, people with disabilities and seniors, and that was not a part of my original intention that that be in the code. And Mr. Gates and I had a conversation, and I wanted to keep this thing fairly pure to just deal with uh, crimes, uh, reporting of crimes against children. But indeed, for vulnerable adults, uh, having our citizens uh, watchful and reporting the abuse issues uh, has merit. Uh, but Mr. Gates suggested that we maybe <coughs> withdraw that from this and leave it more focused on the crimes against children and come back and do the uh, vulnerable adults and so on, where there are abuse issues. Um, I said I didn't imagine that I would have the energy to come back and do another one, uh, but indeed that's a judgment call for us to make, and I have no strong feelings other but I personally have seen in times past uh, uh, adult assistance homes where a bunch of uh, very elderly people were sitting around slumped in a, a wheelchair in a darkened room watching nonsense on television, you know, and it sure felt like animals I've seen uh, in holding pens at a slaughterhouse. And that's, of course, a pejorative statement, and I hope what I saw was absolutely unique, but I didn't report it. And now thinking what I know about it, I think I ducked my responsibility. It's a judgment call. Also, uh, is it in the bill now, or out? Is it? It's in. In now. Yeah, and uh, oh. Mr. Gates. Well, that it's not exactly what's in the ordinance right now. What is in the ordinance now on page six is a barrel to report a violent crime committed against an adult. Sort of companion with on um, page five, barrel to report a violent crime committed against a child person. But Mr. Dyson, we did have that discussion about uh, barrel to report um, neglect for vulnerable adults and things like that. That's not in this ordinance oh. at this time. All right. We didn't talk about possibly doing that in the future. Okay, yeah, so I was inaccurate, and thanks for correcting me, Mr. Dunbar. Yeah, I, I have a question for you, Mr. Chair. Are we going to hear from Ms. Dino? Does she have a presentation on this, or is she sure. for questions? Sure, and uh, we got a bit of time, and there are some folks here who are stakeholders, you know, and, and so on, and I want to give a bit of time for some input from them as well. And Mr. Croft, to uh, in my experience is remarkably insightful, said, what are we going to do with this? You know, and proving a negative is difficult. And we step into a new area of law. Most law has to do with restraining people's activities. <clears throat> the state law on reporting gives a positive duty for citizens to report, and, uh, and particularly the mandatory reporters in state law. Uh, so, uh, so those are worth us thinking about philosophically. Uh, I think Mr. Gates said, in essence, isn't it sad that we have to use the, 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 uh, the leverage of the law to tell citizens what everybody ought to be doing? You know, but uh, <clears throat> be that as it may. Uh, any other questions or comments from colleagues? Is this on the agenda for Tuesday? You know, are we, Mr. Chairman? Are we moving on from this topic to the to another one, or are we yes. continue to talk about this topic? No, I just wanted to know: is it on? Yeah, yeah it was, yeah. and I had asked that we have this meeting before we before we voted on it. Uh, no, I want to hear from uh, uh, are there folks here in the mandatory reporting group or that uh, want to testify or comment? Sure. I'm here with the Anchorage School District. I just want to uh, correct the statement they made uh, last time about the ability of the school district to uh, track the numbers of referrals to OCS. We do have a means to do that. <coughs> and last year, last school year, we had about 1,100 referrals to OCS. Good. 
and thank you for that. And and when you and I first visited, I, I didn't understand that you had that information. I'm glad you've got it, and I'm glad that's known, and I appreciate it. And uh, if it was me that misspoke, probably was. I'm glad to be corrected. Mr. Mel. Can, can you embellish that? What were the referrals for, and were they? I don't know. The notes just say refer to OCS. So that they don't detail what the reasoning was. What I can see is that uh, about 60% of them are at the elementary school level. So those are more likely abuse or neglect, and so on. Yeah. All right. Um, I want to be sure I've got this accurate. When I talked to the superintendent, uh, I understood that she said to me that if a female student comes to the school nurse and asks about pregnancy testing, uh, STDs, or contraception, that the policy of the district is to give that student a uh, a sheet of paper that has the addresses of the organizations that can give those kind of services. If I got that right? Yes, yeah, so the nurse would say, um, are you okay? Have you had, can you have this conversation with your parents? Can you see your primary care provider? And also has that information available. All right, thank you. That's helpful. At what point is it a policy, this is a tough one for you, all of us, is when the kid comes and says, I want to find out if I'm pregnant or not, at what point does the district feel a responsibility to inform the parents? Or the I think if the that's the conversation with them, and and that gets into um, the relationship with the, the student. If the student says, you know, I, I can't do that, there's no, um, if, if the student is saying that they're safe, uh, and there's no obligatory reporting obligation, they're not going to uh, go and do that. And, and that conversation, they could have a conversation with the student say, you, know, you might want to talk to your parents about this. Are you comfortable? But that is, I don't see that as a, as a, a requirement to, uh, to have that conversation by the nurse to the, the parent. Yeah, I, and I suspect that would be your position, and I understand it. Uh, completely um, all right uh, but and I appreciate uh, the, the information when you said that 60% um, of the reports uh, were kids in primary school yeah all right so then 40% of what was the number you gave 60% are at the elementary school up to through fifth grade yeah and how many total reports was it? 1,100. Yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Constant Thank and you. Mr. Wilson. On, on that line of questioning, do you have any sense of how many times students in a given year might come to a nurse and say, hey, I'm pregnant? Is this a common phenomenon in the school district of 50,000 kids? I don't know. You don't know. 48,000, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Wilson. Sorry, are you comfortable with this? going into city law? Well, there's no difference than what the state law is. So the mandatory reporting requirements are, are the same for the nurses, the teachers, and all of it. Read through, I don't see a difference. They all understand what their reporting requirements are. So is there a benefit to putting this in city law? I, I don't see any benefit. Right. And, the, and the nurses fully understand what their obligations are. Right. Thanks. And and that's a very valid point. And it's as Mr. Croft, I think, or, uh, somebody brought up, very difficult to prove a negative. How do you prove somebody didn't report? And and that's tough. I take a very high view of the law, and uh, part of it's 
is biblical, but it says the law is a teacher. And when we make law, we kind of come together through our process and says, this is what we believe, these are the standards, and, and this is who we are. And this is a small step that just helps to reinforce the idea that all of us as adults have a responsibility to go to the aid of the vulnerable and children and do what we can. And hopefully that will help. The other thing that bothers me, it was just reported by a member of the legislature that in the last some period, 7,000 cases were dismissed because they didn't have the resources to go to court. And, uh, and Mr. Croft and several others have pointed out that the court system is overwhelmed, the parole, the investigators uh, it, are all overwhelmed, and when we get 7,000 cases that weren't followed up, so the state is in worse situation financially and law enforcement than we are, and, and because the failure report is a misdemeanor, then we have the chance to use our resources to go after some situations that the state doesn't have the resources and it's not uh, high enough on their priorities. So, Chris. That leads to the question of uh, Ms. Pino, kind of hearing that there isn't any substantive change, kind of hearing that if we have this at local level, it might provide more opportunities. What's the net benefit of this? Is there one? I think that's hard to say. Uh, I don't know, I'm not familiar with what rate at which these kinds of crimes are reported to prosecutors or charges are forwarded. So if it's obviously the circumstance where law enforcement is forwarding charges and there's not resources for them, then there may be great benefit. It's the circumstance where they're not investigated and not forwarding charges, then there may be no appreciable difference adding it to our code. I, I can't say. Yeah, and if I may, I've been talking to some folks on the state level and what will happen is, when there's a crime, a sexual assault of a child, you know, the, the state will go after that. It's all felonies and so on. And the state people who are often overwhelmed and overworked and under-resourced will say, and oh, and oh, by the way, there was probably a very good chance when a mandatory reporter should have reported this because there were few pre previous victims or this victim you know, had seen a mandatory reporter. But the state folks just practically are not going to uh, divert any resources from going after the felony assault and uh, to deal with a responsible person who didn't report. So now we will have the option that they can say to our prosecutor, look at when we went after this crime, we also found out that there was in all probability, a misdemeanor or failure to report and be handed over to you. <coughs> and you will make a decision, you know, and, and so on. Uh, all right. Uh, somebody else had a question, Mr. Dunbar. Yeah, uh, for Ms. Dean, <coughs> and, and this is a very foundational, basic question that I, I shouldn't know the answer to, but I was asked at a community council and I just had a moment where I, I couldn't recall. We discussed it before, but do we need to have this in our code in order for your office to take it? Yes. So you cannot, you cannot charge state Correct. state statutes. Okay. okay. All right. That's 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 sort of the most basic. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Excellent question, Mr. Croft. Do we have any information on whether this is is prosecuted? I understand your point that there may be reasons of resources why it's not. Is it? Do we know that that this is just very rarely prosecuted? Yes, we know that it is very rarely prosecuted. And then the, it really then begs the question, why? Is it because it's not, we had a representative from psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, but saying we police and we think we take our obligations seriously, it's because it doesn't happen or because they don't have the resources to prosecute it. And so how do we know that next step? Yeah, and it's a very good one. And I, I'm, regardless of what we do here, I'm working with several particularly at Child Protective Services and so on, to go after some of that, why why not and what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. um, so this is not the end, it's only beginning, but being able to prosecute it and it will be on the exception basis. Anybody else want to testify? And by the way, the man who was here from the, the psychiatrist 
we have gone back and changed uh, some of the language in in our uh, cover letter that goes with this and the, there's so little data my my assumption is that the licensed professionals marriage and family counselors psychiatrists uh, and uh, so on are pretty darn rigorous about reporting and my wife was one of those for 20 years and uh, so on what I don't know is the institutions you know and I have a couple of their stonewalling me and just giving me the raw numbers and, and, and that's bothersome Suzanne thank you mr. chair um, a question for Ms. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that it would be hard to tell if there would be benefits to this change. Um, would there be any downside to enacting it? Uh, as to most of it, the answer would be no. Again, there may be no appreciable difference at all. Um, I, we do have some concerns about the sexual abuse of a minor section, um, requiring additional resources on our office. Number on page three, it's section 850.035. Um, section A1 there is prosecution of a juvenile, person under the age of 16. We don't do that now as a matter of course. Juveniles under that age would be handled through juvenile court um, through uh, a much different process than what's handled in the criminal courts in the district court. And so that would require uh, us to be practicing in two different courts, utilizing two different systems. Um, and having different goals through the, the extent of those prosecutions. Um, and so we do have a concern about that, sort of venturing into a territory that, that we don't practice in otherwise. Um, and then as to A2, um, which is the sexual assault uh, by a person that would be under our jurisdiction, um, I think it was mentioned before, but I'll mention it again, that the state, the Anchorage District Attorney's Office does have a sexual assault unit. They're specifically setting up this summer and they go through special training, special educational ex experiences and exposure to be very adept at prosecuting those. Our guys haven't been through that. We don't have sexual assault in our code, so we don't have specific training related to that other than general domestic violence training. Uh, and so I, it is my personal opinion that that section may be better prosecuted by the state uh, with their expertise. And so there would be nothing that would preclude it from being a done by the state even if we put this in our ordinance correct that's true okay all right i want to get in a couple people here to testify before we're done okay but that was my question mr croft then very quickly <coughs> is the majority, i thought the age majority was 18 so is it a2 as well being aged 18 years or older did that okay and 16 and under 16 is there I'll, I'll work out the whether what how what you do with seventeen year olds and sixteen year olds. Um, it, so just a quick question, then, uh, Mr. Dyson, if if the if the concern is lack of uh, mandatory reporters, institutional mandatory reporters reporting, why why put this section? Because that's not what that's not hitting the the harm you worry is out there, is it? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. But Mr. Gates. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. This section's added, Mr. Lee, at my suggestion. So Mr. Dyson's main thrust was the mandatory reporter law, but also protection of minors. And um, in looking at state law, we basically wanted to duplicate state law, making crimes that protect minors part of our code, as well as the other misdemeanor level crimes that protect minors from sexual offenses and suggested they be included within this purpose that he has. So um, this statute, I mean this provision 850.35 um, versus it's duplicated from sexual abuse of a minor in fourth degree from state law, which is a misdemeanor level crime. Uh, there's third degree and second degree and first degree sexual abuse of a minor in state law, which are felonies. So I didn't suggest including those when I'm including families. As similar to with the other crime, um, unfiling pages, where we report violent crime committed against a child. That's included at my suggestion to Mr. Dyson, which is consistent with his objectives in general terms of protecting minors against sexual offenses in all. Because it's, it doesn't make much sense to have a misdemeanor law that says it's a misdemeanor 
I'm sorry, municipal misdemeanor to fail to report a state crime. It would make more sense to include that crime in our code. Yes. We're mis yep. We're yep. 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 And you, you put your finger on something, and sorry, I was confused. I got that stuff put in state law 10 years ago. And it, and it, it has the effect of giving every citizen some responsibility to go to the aid of a child that's being kidnapped, assaulted, <clears throat> and so on. And, uh, Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, we'll end this part of the hearing. I, I want to... Uh, Mr. Leva called me with uh, a very sad and startling report of what he experienced, and uh, I want him to give us uh, a somewhat brief rendition of what happened. I've asked him to stick to the facts of what happened and, and so on, And uh, but it's very, uh, very disturbing. Mr. Leva? Yeah, hey, you got a hair uh, My name is Ronald Leva. I'm a 44 year president of the group. It's very difficult for me to tell the story because of the so traumatic and violent that I'm going to seek not only counseling but therapy and add it to my management classes. Uh, Beans Cafe and Brother Francis is a nucleus and it's supposed to be uh, Ron, a partner. just I, what I, happened. I'm just going to tell you that I experienced watching a forcible sexual assault, both orally in the vestibule of the John Franklin building. A man held a woman to his genitals until I circled and called 911, etc., etc., and he still had her up. Whether she was 10, 15 or not, it didn't matter. I witnessed it 8 o'clock in the morning. No security provided by the Brother Francis shelter at that time. The second one, and if I can remain calm, the second one is so disgusting, I would ask the women to leave and not listen to this. Because when I went to ship out to Talkeetna, piece of equipment under my trailer was a man naked, half pants down. He performed every sexual act I could possibly think of from oral, digital. Uh, he had an instrument. I don't know if it was a dildo or a bottle, but used this on this woman, tore apart her legs, treated her like a gumby toy, and tore her apart. I had my 357. Should I have shot him? or taking picture for documentation. I called 911, they put me on hold. I called my staff to come over and assist me. I did not shoot them. I did not interrupt them because with this meth, spice, etc., she was so limp and he was so violent that during a sexual act they can choke him to death, which happened, they said to the guy a couple weeks ago, killed him. So is it better she be killed or suffer that indignity of those sexual acts. Now, I, I know my voice is rising to prevent me from crying at the complexity of the Brother Francis and Beans not monitoring that situation. They're feeding that problem, and they're creating an expansion of that problem. And I can tell you, with even the ex-judge's letter, I cannot go to work any further because I was shaking so hard, I couldn't have shot him. I would have shot the other person. So, Ron, so tell us what the cops came. The and cops helped. came. You had he was, he pictures was together. still on top of her, was about to tase her, and then seven more showed up. She went to the hospital. He allegedly got cuffed. She didn't want to be examined or press charges that night back at the shelter. And so, you had this revolving door. Any of those sexual acts continue on a daily basis, and Beans and the Brother Francis actually provide the environment for that to happen because they are out of control with mismanagement, and that has to change. If there's going to be any decency or level of civility in the city in getting back our parks, our bike trails, and my place of employment, because I'm so scared now, my counselor said, Don't go down there because they retaliate against me. I've been punched in the face, basically spit on, my car's been assaulted, and if I go down there, do I use the gun? No, I'm leaving. All right, tell them what you did with the garbage cans and the I trees. put out, because of the lack 
of the garbage being picked up from the overflow from beans who leaves their dumpsters open and actually gives them cardboard and garbage to sit on and the shelter gives them clothes, it ends up all over. I put out 36 garbage cans and I gave them the liners. It helped. But well, why do I have to report the tents? It's their job to report the tents as soon as they appear. They have that responsibility in their conditional use. Right. What else would you like to hear? Yeah, did you say something about trees or something? I planted 32 trees and I fenced it off just so they wouldn't camp there. But the urination, I've gone with chlorine and hay. I've asked middle Linda Freeman who left to disinfect the entire area because that's a spread of all diseases, STDs, uh, tuberculosis, hepatitis, age with the needles that I have to pick up. I have a sharps container that's two gallons, that's three quarters full. And don't say the cops, I, I thank them all because they're at risk. And I have a siren, a train horn, and a PA system. I have a noise permit for the PA system. And if I ring, I have the tsunami warning system from Kenai. As soon as an officer is killed, a fireman or a first responder, I'm going to blow that tsunami warning system so they hear it at Eagle River to Girdwood that you guys didn't take action to prevent that. Right. So don't go to any memorial service when we ring that bell for the 63rd time. Don't do that. All right. Thanks, Ron. Any questions? <laughs> I cleaned up because I'm meeting the governor. We're going to call it the militia. All right. All right. Um, sorry for the grossness of the Yeah. I'm sorry. We're out of town. We're out of time. This meeting is adjourned.